this is obviously Nick Robertson, the founder of ASOS. Big, big thank you to Nick for agreeing to do this because he doesn't do this very much anymore, if not, if at all. And thank you to the team at Klarna who are here today and who've sponsored this event. This event is a culmination of a programme that we've been working on with Klarna called Bold Moves and it's about entrepreneurs and it's about people like you, many of you are entrepreneurs, who have done brave things in your careers and found new, new niches and changed the industry. But I wanted to start talking about the bit that was maybe a bit difficult in a good way. Um, so I think uh, I'm going to go back to the very beginning. I'm going to take you back to school because I want to talk about that on behalf of your poor parents. Um, <laughs> then we'll talk about how you set up ASOS. But I want to talk about the point at which you were looking to replace yourself as CEO. You've obviously announced a new CEO for ASOS this morning. Well, I'll have a word about him at the end. But you had been CEO since it started in 2000. And I think we had lunch in about I don't know, say 2014, something like that. And you were saying to me, oh, I think I might take a step back. I've had it, I've, I've, I've taken it this far. The next few years are all about 20, 30 percent growth. That's not really interesting to me. Frankly, I'm a little bit bored. And you said to me these words and I sort of scoffed at them at the time. But then I went away and thought about it. And I thought, actually, I do believe he's speaking the truth. And you said to me, I miss the struggle. I miss the struggle. There'll be people out here who are in the midst of the struggle thinking, really? Enjoy it. <laughs> <laughs> what was the struggle and what did you like about it? Um, that's a good one. So, oh, blimey. Um, it's true, though. You did, though. You you seemed like a happier well, person. There's definitely a phase where, yeah. where, you know, your livelihood just depends on it. So so you, it is a struggle. Everything's a struggle. But in a good way and, and, the, and the sort of camaraderie you have and the team spirit you have and the jump out of bed in the morning because you... You know, we don't like struggle generally, but you know, because everything's a struggle, that's kind of what you're used to, and that just becomes ingrained. And when that sort of slows, um, it wasn't that it wasn't a struggle; there were just really different struggles, and 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 there were struggles that I didn't enjoy. So, you know, struggling, um, you know, at, at its most basic level, uh, there's one point in the journey where you know everybody in the office. If you want something done, you know exactly who to go to. Um, if you don't know who to go to, you know exactly who to go to to find the person. You, you know, and, and it's all manageable. And suddenly, you sort of break out into this place where you're looking around and you don't know half the people, and you certainly don't know what they do. And then, and then when you want something done, it's like, well, who do I go to for that? And then, and then everything just takes infinitely longer than it ever used to. So I just thought that was interesting because you you actually really enjoyed building it, you know, um, and overcoming some challenges. Yeah, I mean, you know, you. I, I, you know, we were the lucky ones, weren't we? The first first five years were awful because we just had no money and it was a struggle and mm. nobody was shopping online and we were rubbish and it was just horrendous. <laughs> um, but, you know, then we had that lovely sort of 10-year period and it was it just did. phenomenal. It was, know? wasn't it? It was, it was brilliant. It was a real and, purple And the patch. spirit and the mm. fun and, you know, it was, you know, ASOS was fun and hard work and, and it was in that yeah. order, really. Yeah. And we just loved it and I sort of lost 30 years of my life and my liver <laughs> <laughs> probably as a result. It was that two, 2005, 2010. It was uh, the whole amazing, kind yeah. of, I mean, I dare I say it now, but it was that whole fast fashion era, wasn't it? And Grazia and uh, it was all, everybody just suddenly loved yeah. fashion and it was, yeah. and you were the darlings of all that, yeah. weren't you? Yeah. yeah, I mean, you know, that, that's, that's the sort of the irony behind all of it. You know, we had no fashion background. No. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. We'd never worked in fashion. We've had this conversation. I know, yeah. and it's just it's just bizarre that we, we managed to end up being big in fashion, having no fashion experience whatsoever. We that, can that, talk about that. That's, that's the first the leap, which is, look, you know, actually I can do something. Because I was working for Cara, we had lots of clients, and I knew if we could provide them with this service, those clients would sort of roll in. So it was a fairly low-risk entry into sort of setting up our own business. But that gives us, you know, gave us a lot of discipline. So a mm. bit like you running yours, conversations bar, you know, yeah. you, you you run a tight ship, right? Yeah. And um, yeah. and we ran a we ran a tight ship. It was reasonably su successful. Interstate marketing was effectively like a, a product placement agency. So we would put brands in onto celebrities, into TV programs, into films. Um, we would do broadcast sponsorship. We still see it about, you know, where sort of advertisers front and back mm. programs. We would uh, do ad funded programming where you know, advertisers were paid to effectively produce the content which they could then brand. So it was sort of, you know, in the absence of programs that they wanted that were suitable, they would make their own programs, we would make those, brand them, and then broadcast them. So, okay. you know, it was all that sort of non-traditional media we talked at the time. But because we were working with celebrities, putting brands on celebrities, that's where the As Seen On Screen came from, because it was sort of, 
how can we, just as the internet was bubbling along, how could mm -hmm. we, you know, how could the internet benefit the sort of celebrity product placement thing? Yeah. And it was like, well, hold on, actually, we could sort of have a website, a web page at the time, where we could have the picture of the celebrity, picture of the sunglasses, and tell people where the sunglasses were from. I know everybody's sort of going a bit mad, but <laughs> there was some sort of logic in there, and yeah. and then it we thought that we, we thought the brands would pay us to be on this page, right? But mm. obviously they didn't, and we didn't have any traffic. <laughs> so the <laughs> so the, the only way we could do it was to um, to sell the to sunglasses. Sell them. So then you um, and then obviously at that point, because my brother had done the one nine two, he had a website. And as, as that started to get bigger, the original team who built that really early website was sort of looking for a new challenge. So we took them on. So we were lucky in the early days that we actually had you know, two oh. of the 10 people in the UK who probably knew how to build a website <laughs> at that point. So you weren't actually necessarily into fashion at the time. It was stuff that celebrities potentially wore or were see or mm. things that were in mm. TV shows and films and stuff like that. When did the fashion focus come into the business and how did that happen because you said yourself and we joke about it, but you weren't into fashion it wasn't your thing you know so the experience that i think i bought was this branding and marketing thing so we understood mm. customers we understood having a tightly defined customer group we understand giving those customers what they wanted and and, mm. and at that point it was you know the real heat and now magazine sort of generation yeah um which seems old fad now but you know mm. back then it was the first well, that time was the instagram this... of the day wasn't it right yeah. so you know it was the first time you had pictures of you know aspirational people wearing mm. stuff and it was you know where to get it where to buy it and so we were the sort of link between the page on a on a in a magazine mm. which was very useful but obviously had no buy button attached to it so it was a question of could we put Close the buy button thing. next to the celebrity wearing the product and then sort of link the whole thing together what i thought was smart was you, you what you quickly did once you got the fashion side rocking and rolling is you did persuade some very good people it was like you literally walked up and down oxford street and went into top shop and river island new look whatever and found some really good people and said come and do this with me and they took a risk i mean it seems crazy because like, people would want to go and work for you but um at the time they didn't and I, I thought it was quite a good lesson there in getting the right people around you because you had some great ones That's we were looking at through a completely it? different lens yeah. we were going right customer on website present them with everything they could possibly ever want in the world of fashion. Because we're looking at Amazon over there and they were literally adding categories by the day. You know, it's like, oh my God, you know. And then, so we had Amazon over there adding categories by the day. We're with the mindset going, right, let's just keep adding more and more fashion to this website. We didn't care, you know, obviously there needed to be brands that were relevant. But even in that journey, you know, the brands that are relevant, you can't get because they're on fire and they don't want to be with you. So you're getting the brands that are sort of relevant, but just tipped into their, they're now looking for other partners, wholesale partners, you know, expand their sort of reach. You know, we were solving a completely different problem, which is how could we put as many brands in one place? Um, and then we look at the department stores and go, well, that's not unusual. You know, department mm -hmm. stores put all these brands in one place, so why wouldn't we? It wasn't unusual, and department stores have been doing it for years. Topshop was even doing it themselves in their mm. basement, of, mm. of flagship. Yeah. But nobody sort of followed suit online. And you know, the, the reason the high street didn't, or, or Topshop didn't do that, because he just couldn't get his head genuinely around putting his product next to River Island or New Look in the same. Is that what it was? In the same store, completely. Uh, yeah, it felt like you had it your own way for quite a while, didn't you? Um, online, because it took the department stores. I mean, there, there was a Yannetta Porte in, in luxury. They had it their own way in luxury, and you kind of had it your own way on the high street side of things. For a long time, it took everybody a long time to catch on to it. And I, I wondered, were you sort of keep looking and thinking that surely they're going to come? And you, you, I mean, you, sure, surely Topshop yeah. had to do what we were doing. Yeah. You know, and they already did it in their flagship store. You know, they had other brands down there. So yeah. it would have been... Logical, but I think they were still just working out how to do it themselves and trying to work he out. He tried. Well, sorry, they, they were all, always operating against the backdrop of, oh my God, if I sell something online, then that's cannibalizing my, my store. store. You yeah. know? And, and that, that, that was a sort of 10 year journey in their heads as well to understand that actually they've got to do it. So even if it cannibalizes, don't worry about it because ultimately it'll, it'll sort of work out. I mean, here's the question really Did you set out and think, I'm going to get a business that's going to turn over 4 billion quid and no. it, global blah? No. 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 That just I mean, happened along the way. Right? Um, right, Def definitely no idea of what the, what the scale could be. Yeah, but the sense was, hold on, we're doing something that nobody else is really doing. The market is huge. Mm. If we do it better than anybody else, you know, against the backdrop that customers, and it's still to, still true to some degree. You know, mm. you just, if you make their lives easier, they they're going to be loyal, right? And actually, life easier in fashion is to present as much stuff under one roof so they're not chopping and changing. Especially back in the early days yeah. where the website experience across so many of the other brands was so appalling. 
you know, be it in terms of payment options or delivery or returns policy, or, you know, so you just made it easy. Mm. So we kept looking at that and going, well, blimey, if we got a small percentage of this very big pot, you know, but but it's it's challenging online. And, and I've actually got a lot of admiration now for, you know, the next of this world who, oh, you know, have managed to do both, business. who've managed to keep the margins up. I want to ask you about Topshop, because ASOS, interestingly, unlike, say, Boohoo, um, which has grown through acquisition, you didn't. It was all organic, really, right? Um, but Topshop, did you absolutely have to have it? I mean, was that personal? Was it? Because <laughs> <No. laughs> you you saw off sweet. quite. You, it was um, sweet, yeah. But you saw off quite a lot of people. That was quite a battle for that brand, wasn't it? And I thought, well, well you it was must an, have it really an interesting one it. because actually we, we had the inside trap because we mm. sold a lot of Topshop, you know. Yeah. So after I stepped down, mm. Philip sort of came on board <laughs> i think i was the blocker actually <laughs> whilst i was still at the helm he was not coming on a sub but i think you know when other nick took over then yeah. they sort of patched things up a bit mm. um so then topshop came aboard but it meant we were you know a very big seller of topshop yeah. so in doing the deal we understood the value of it more so than others and, and mm. if others wanted to do the deal they'd have to sort of because we were a big chunk of their wholesale business right, right. so so they kind of needed us on board so that would be us you know, people were coming to us going, if we buy it, will you come on board? And go, hmm, well, maybe, we'll maybe see. not, you know. Yeah. So so we had the sort of inside tracks. So we, we knew what it was worth to us, which was probably more than it was worth to Anybody others. else. Yeah. What do you think, what would you do if you were in this audience now and you thought, right, I'm going to set up a fashion business now, what would it look like? Um, well, you know, ironically, I'm, I'm sort of invested in a couple of brands, so I'm, I'm sort of in your space, weirdly, um, with, with a couple of things. And, you know, it's tough. It's really, really tough, and um, and and it sounds cliched, but you know the old adage is apply. You've, you've got to have a point of difference. You've got you've got to have something that is is world class compared to anybody else in your space. Mm. Um, and if you're not, then I just think you're going to struggle. And you know, I'm telling you this, and I'm I've got my own brands, and you know, they're not world class. And I just know that until we can become world class at whatever it is we're doing, you know, either through design or through uniqueness or technical capability or you know whatever it is whatever's going to, going to make it stand out and the, and the story behind that um so product 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 and then everything else bit of service um, product first uh, well yeah. you know f from a brand perspective you can get away without the sort of amazon ASOS you can service actually yeah because people for do a period of time yeah um no, but then you. you know the right brand will sit on some of these platforms as well you know, mm. that, that's not a bad yeah. place to be in. no that's true that's um, true you know, I, li I like the situation now where I, c I can be helpful to the board. Um, you know, they do sometimes sort of take some what I say quite seriously. And, you know, <laughs> I, I love that sort of, I've got the interaction without having the responsibility, I suppose. Yeah. Um, so I'm, I'm in a good space with, with ASOS. I, I couldn't leave ASOS completely. That would be, Ooh, that would be too, too much of a wrench. I wondered yeah. about that. If you've got a question, could you just do the usual raise your hand. And when the mic comes in your direction, could you tell us who you are and where you're from and then put your question to Nick if you wouldn't mind so hi Nick thanks for a fascinating morning so far um, my, I'm Nana uh, founder of Hope Fashion and I remember seeing you some years ago and you talked to them my takeaway then was this line that you gave that there'll always be a lot of 25 year olds in the world and that was your target customer I guess with your brand now over 20 years old, are you still targeting 25 year olds or has, has your customer moved on or have you moved on with your customer? That, that's another good question and, and actually it's the easiest one for me to answer. Um, no is a short answer. We will go back and we'll get younger. We, we, won't, we won't get older. I'm Nick from Neem. A lovely uh, conversation this morning. Really enjoyed it. I want to ask a broad uh, question, really, about what impact you think climate change awareness will have on fashion in the, the next five or ten years. Mm. Um, well, be before sort of climate change came along, you know, everybody was worried about ethical supply chains and. You know, um, labor and slave labor and where you know you know and we, we've spent years tightening all that up um because fast fashion you know didn't bask itself in glory in that space um and you know to be in fast fashion you're generally moving your sort of supply base around anyway because you, you can't just rely on certain territories because one year it's beading one year it's lace one year it's denim one year it's jersey you know so you so you are doing a bit of that moving around 
And we always said, look, you know, when when a customer's actually going to vote with their feet now, because because you can't sell a dress for nine ninety nine and expect that to have been adhered to. Hi, Nick. I'm Claire. I was um, the head of external comms at M&S when you did overtake us, and it was a totemic <laughs> moment for us. Sorry, I would Claire. Say. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm working with Nana at Hope Fashion, and mm. I um, I wanted to ask you about the tough times because the conversations mm. I've had in the room today of, of almost everyone has unanimously said it's it's been really hard. You know, we've come out of COVID, Brexit, and actually this year is getting even harder. Was there a moment at ASOS where you thought, we can't do this? And what advice would you give to the people who might be feeling that or getting ready to feel that right mm. now? Because I think it is really tough, especially in e-commerce. When you're in it, you don't really sort of, um, you, know, you know it's horrible, but you, you're in survival mode at that point, right? And, you, and you, you're, you're, you know, I, I always remember thinking, it's bad. And then something else would happen, you go, this is really bad. And then... <laughs> Something else would happen. You go. I mean, oh. I thought that was bad, but this is really, really bad now. And it's amazing how far you can keep going back, you know, in badness <laughs> before it really, really, you know. So, so it's sort of degrees of bad. And what, and you know, if you've had a, if you've, if you've had it okay, then the first little thing you think's bad. But trust me, the, there's a whole lot more badness that you can get to before you know things get really, really bad. If that makes sense. Um, yeah, we've we've had all of the you know can't pay the salaries, laying people off, um, you know, Horrible. just all the horrendous stuff that sort of businesses go through, and it, and, it, and that's where your you know your personal reserve and personal fight, and you know we we were lucky, I suppose we 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 were fighting for something, but I think we were fighting for something without knowing what the outcome would be. So you, you just you just find gears that you just never even thought you had, and you just find the resolve from somewhere to to battle on through. You are, no, listen, you don't have to do it, and you did it, and I really appreciate it, and I hope that the audience really appreciated it as well, and our friends at Klarna certainly did. So thank you very much, Nick, and thank you all of you for listening and for your fabulous questions. Thank you very, very much for coming, Nick. Let's have a little round of applause for you. Thank you so much. Thank you.